everyone welcome to wednesday night mythic conversations van i am sorry i couldn't play any slayer for you so instead i did a little obla di obla da by the beatles one of my favorite songs so little surprise intro to uh add to the happy music i, I love that whole comments where i see people saying cue the happy music i love uh I love that. So not only do we cue the happy music tonight, we doubled up on the happy music. Let me put this back. We are back. Speaking of being back, we are back here tonight for Mythic Conversations. We took last week off because I was in the middle of a pretty crazy travel schedule, right? So that's some of the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. There's actually a lot that has gone on in the world of legions in the last few weeks. Um, a few weeks before my trip, I had a couple guests. So I'm once again solo this evening, going to talk all about what's going on and going to recap some of the things that happened, some of the trips. Uh, MuskeCon a couple weeks ago, my first trip to Michigan to hang out with that crew. Uh, then, of course, we had Toylanta this past weekend. In the middle of all that, there's been a bunch of cool stuff that has happened. There was also ToyCon New Jersey and the return of the king, our one and only corn boy in New Jersey this weekend. So we're going to talk all about that tonight. Let's see. Checking out what is in the comments here. Thank you, everyone, very, very much for your comments and for tuning in. Um, whether or not you are tuning in live and you are in the chat this evening to be part of this conversation or whether you are on the replay crew, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, be sure to give the video a like, comment if you have any questions. I do get to those questions and answer everything that I can. So if you're not live and you can't ask it here, course you can ask it there uh yes andy toylanta was where i found the shogun warriors godzilla last year um i did have a very sad toylanta missed opportunity this year uh one of the things we're going to look at later is that at muskecon i got one of the Inhumanoids figure, the big giant monster demon-like character called Metlar. I already have Tendril, so the only one I was missing was Decompose. I went into Toylanta looking for Decompose. Um, I found Decompose. It was actually at a really good price. I tried to go a little bit lower. The guy wouldn't do it, so I made the mistake of saying, oh, I'll wait until Sunday and see if I can grab it. And, of course, it sold on Saturday. So... I left there absolutely being very uh, bummed that I didn't just pull the trigger on that decompose figure. So if anyone watching this video has an Inhumanoids decompose in fairly good shape that they're looking to get rid of, let me know. Okay, let's see. So uh, yeah, so stuff going on. Two weeks ago, I went out, uh, Jim and myself, we flew out to Muskegon, Michigan for MuskeCon. Uh, it's that if, if you're familiar, that's where the, the crew from my wife is going to kill me live out there in Michigan. Uh, this is actually Muskegon or Muskecon is Pete McCarthy's show. One of that, those crew members, Pete Torian. So it was a lot of fun to get out there. I had been, I had been looking for an excuse to get out to Michigan and hang out with those guys for a number of years. 
like actually. And it just, it never really worked out. Um, last year, I, I can't remember what was going on, but there was a reason why I couldn't make the trip last year. This year, it was in the cards for me to get out there and do it. Um, and it was an absolute blast. They put on a really cool event where MuskeeCon is just a one day show, it's just a Saturday. But the Friday night, they had vendors set up and they also did a, uh, like a, they called it a mythic, a Midwest mythic meetup is what they called it. And it really had very similar to like a Legions Con 1 type vibe for me. So Legions Con 1, for those who were around and at that show, um, that was bigger. There were more people there and it had exhibitors. This didn't really have exhibitors. It was more just people hanging out, but there were giveaways and uh, everyone was just having a really, really fun time. Uh, those guys gave away so much cool stuff, not only that they donated, um, but also different members of the community. Some of the exhibitors that were there, like Dang Studios, uh, uh, Drunk Gizmo, a bunch of these different people. And I'm going to forget a lot of people, but they gave away stuff as well, which was super cool. So it was a really neat vibe. I loved that community aspect because that's literally why I enjoy going to these things. And it was cool for me personally because it was a show that I wasn't running. So unlike Legion's Con that I helped run with Joe Vettieri, or even unlike a show like Toylanta this past weekend, where I'm genuinely working and, you know, the table, like we're running our table. MuskeeCon was a street team show. So Travis and uh, Nate Strong were actually working the table. And actually, let me get to that. I have a, a fun picture of that. So this was, this was kind of the table crew at... MuskeeCon. So Nate Strong and Travis were behind the table there. They were the ones that were taking money um, and dealing with all that aspect, which allowed me to just kind of hang around, greet fans, spend way too much money at the con. Uh, thanks, Gavin, by the way. Uh, so it was a great, great experience. And the Friday night, especially, I was able to just cut loose and hang out and have a good time. And one of the coolest things happened to me at the show. So I met a gentleman named Chris Johnson, who I think I saw in the chat earlier today, and I'm walking around the Mythic Meetup, right? And he says to me, he comes up and he says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm newer to Legions. You know, I really appreciate everything you do for the community and your, uh, you know, your channel and stuff like that, um, which was great to hear. I, I always love when that this is appreciated. What I do here is appreciated. But he says, I have a little gift for you. So I was like, oh, that's awesome. And I had no idea what it was going to be. A lot of times when someone says that, they have like a 3D printed head or something for me, which I always appreciate. It's always very nice. But then this dude absolutely blows me away and he hands me this. So he hands me a hand-drawn picture of Sir Gerard. And I actually also have a picture of Chris and myself I mean, like I said, completely, completely blown away. I shared this on the Cabal already. Uh, I have it actually right here. I haven't had time. I just got back, you know, a couple days ago from my trip. So I haven't had a chance to actually frame this yet, but it's going to go right over here. So this wall that's right behind me. You know, I have my Kitsune uh, art from uh, Robson Rocha who passed away. And then actually you can't really see it, but up here I actually have uh, a photo of a troll that I did from Alexander Deshaw. He gave me, he gave me this. He drew that years ago based on one of my customs and they gave it to me. And then I have a photo, a, a watercolor painting of again, one of my Kitsune um, by, you know, one of my friends, Bill. So this is going to be added to the wall as well. I actually do have a better shot of it here that Chris shared in the cabal. So let me bring that up. Like, look at how cool that is. I mean, what, what an incredibly cool gesture. You know, I, I thank Chris personally, of course, and I thanked him, you know, online, but I, I had to start today's show with just another, you know, bit of appreciation for how how much getting this this kind of a personal gift moved me so 
Super cool. Thank you so much. And what a great, great way to start that whole Muskegon. Muskegon. I, I have such a hard time saying it. Muskegon and Muskegon. Every time I try to say it, I forget which one I'm trying to say. And I don't see either of them. I just butcher it. Um, I got to go to uh, Lord Stephen Bashadi's house and hang out for a little while. That was super cool to see his collection. I love seeing other people's collections. So getting over there and seeing that, um, I don't collect the Mondo Masters of the Universe stuff, but I love it. I think it looks great. Steven's got all of it. So seeing all of it there was super, super cool. Um, so yeah, a great, great experience at MesquiteCon. And one of the things that, we did at MesquiteCon during that that uh, mythic meetup was Pete had asked me, he said, hey, do you have anything that we can reveal at the, the show? Um, and I, I thought about it and there was really nothing figure wise that it made sense to show there. But I said to him, I said, you know what? There's a project that we've been working on that we haven't revealed to anybody. I think that this would make a good thing to reveal there. So this is what I brought. And if you've seen, we did post this on uh, on the Four Horsemen channel as well, the Facebook page and the YouTube, not the YouTube, the Instagram. But what we unveiled is I started the, the discussion and I said, you know, I know a lot of people here are probably interested in an update on the Mythic Legion's book. And everyone, you know, got excited, like, oh, yeah, I didn't update an update. And I said, but I'm not talking about the book you know about, like the storybook, The Rise of the Dark Four. I'm actually talking about a book project that you don't even know exists yet. And this book, which we are calling Mythic Legions, The First Ten Years, we hadn't even alluded to the fact that we were doing this. It's something that a lot of people have requested over the years. So to be able to actually drop this and unveil it was super cool. So I've got a couple pages I can show you here, um, and I'll give you a little insight into what this is. So for quite some time, people have asked, fans have asked for kind of like a visual encyclopedia of the Mythic Legions line. And it was always something I was hesitant to do because the minute that the book gets published, Mythic Legions, the line is not done. You know, we're still moving forward. We've got a lot of plans. So whenever you put out a book, it's immediately going to be outdated, right? It immediately doesn't cover everything you've put out. And that was always one of my apprehensions. But now we are at a point, both from a time standpoint, 10 years, as well as from a just story arc, you know, in the line that those two things colliding at the same time it's a perfect time to say okay this is the first book this is where we are going to start it this is where we are going to end it so that's what this book will cover this book will start with mythic legions one and it will go well if you heard my interview that i did with mal from the euro legions podcast you know that i didn't say when the book ends because you don't know you haven't seen the way that this book ends on yet but what the book is going to contain is some information about every single wave. So this, the, the page that you have on the screen right now, you can see that it's got a photo up there in the top right corner. That is that is actually when Mythic Legions first debuted at the Toypocalypse show in 2014. So the Kickstarter that started Mythic Legions was 2015, but we consider 2014 to be the start of Mythic Legions when it debuted at Toypocalypse. So this, every wave will have pages like this that are chapters of the book that talk the chapters of the book that talk about you know the wave and any interesting things around it so here you can see the toypocalypse debut you can see that first uh that kickstarter this is what the actual kickstarter page looked like when it was funded you know here we've got more of that chapter where we've got some of the art from nate barch the the card art that was created we've seen that card art many times but that's where it was created so this is the kind of book that we're going to get on this page you can see 
that that post in the top left corner that says they're here that is actually the update that was posted on the kickstarter that cornboy wrote when the mythic legions truck arrived and you can see them unloading that container that was mythic legions one which i love that photo because i've said this before that mythic legions one was 34 figures and it was a single container worth of product you look at you know poxis today and the poxis wave is you know 10 figures and it was five containers worth of product so really really shows that growth but it's really cool to see these historical photos now this is going to be the meat and potatoes of the book the book is going to have a page for every single figure that's come out it'll be sequential it'll be alphabetical by wave so it'll start with wave one and then it'll go through all those characters what it will have is both a front photo the dynamic photo which also usually is the alternate head if the figure has one a back shot and then an accessory shot and as part of this you know this also kind of gets us off the uh, you know what we've wanted to do for a while is update the website with all these images um trevor's just been so busy with other work that we give him that this hasn't become a priority so now that we have this book project trevor is just plugging away photographing all those figures from older waves that he's never gotten to um it will also include information about the figure the bio of that character, and then any interesting information about that particular figure. There's actually some really cool stuff, some really cool, I, I've written all the stuff already. So going through every figure, figure by figure, there's some that are not, there's not a lot to say about them. There's others that have some really cool background stuff that you may not know that I think will be fun to share. Um, Maverick saying, what is the physical size of the book look like? So let me show you Maverick. Um, give me one moment here. So this is a book that we're using kind of as a guide. Um, this is a book by our friends, Pixel Dan and Val Staples that covers the toys of masters of the universe. Um, this is one, obviously, there's a ton of Four Horsemen work in here because the 2000X line and the Masters Classics line are all covered in this. But you can see, I don't believe that our book is going to be this thick. I feel like this is like a 700-page book. I think ours will probably be more in like the 350 range. So it'll probably be about half as thick as this. But dimension-wise, this is kind of what we're shooting for, a nice, substantial hardcover volume. That's that's the idea a book for all those coffee tables uh no albert this is the first 10 years of mythic legions so this will have nothing to do with those older lines like gothtropolis and seventh kingdom so again continuing here just pages for every single character of course because i was at mesquite con i showed the the furious four pages i thought that would be fun to show off Lord Bashadi, Pelvicus, Petorion, and Uwit. But those pages also showed me, you know, allowed me to show how some certain figures might have additional content. So beyond just those four figures, the Furious Four, there's other pages, like being able to show how the packaging was created. So you had the two pack and then the singles that all had different heads on them. So you could lay out all the figures. Um, the one with the fifth member, Cody Cat, and then even this one that's got that great environment shot that Trevor Williams did, the art that Nate did specifically for that crew, along with the logo he created, and those guys with their figures. So that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that Motu does weigh a ton, Billy. I Absolutely. So yeah, so that's going to be a project that I'm personally really, really excited for. Uh, and it's something that we are plugging along with now. I mentioned that Trevor's shooting all the photographs. It's something that I hope to be able to solicit later this year. And, you know, what I said in that interview with Mal is the great thing about a book like this, a book project, is once we solicit it, because we will do a pre-order for it, so we know how many to produce. We've never done this before, so we have no sense of what to actually produce. But once we actually produce it we will be able to get it you know once we do the pre-order we'll be able to get it into production pretty quickly um 
doing a book is not going to be as challenging for us timeline wise as, you know, cutting steel tooling and putting out figures. So once we solicit, the goal is to hopefully have it in fans hands a few months later. Very cool. So again, reaction in the chat tonight's looking pretty positive for this, which is very much like what we heard at MesquiteCon as well. Let me see what other photos I have here from MesquiteCon. Yeah, so this photo, of course, I mentioned that I picked up an Inhumanoids Metlar. There's me with my, my Metlar figure. So maybe not as epic as my Toylanta Godzilla purchase last year, but still very, very cool and very, very fun. So when I came home last week now, right, in that little short period of time, I came home on last Sunday, the Sunday before uh, last, uh, I had a few days at home. And in that period of time, we actually dropped a pretty cool surprise. Let me bring this up here. We dropped the surprise that Four Horsemen intern for a day lottery was open. People have been asking about this for quite some time. So we were thrilled to be able to finally get this open. Uh, let's see. Looking at, I'm just looking at questions here to see what I, if there's anything I need to answer specifically about the book. Uh, Steven, no, we don't know what the book's cost will be yet. We've got to actually finish doing the book and get prices from printers before we have any idea of what the solicitation price will be for it. Um, it is something we're going to self-publish. So it's not something at this point, at least, that we plan on using a publisher for. So there'll be that. It'll all be done through us. Um, so yeah, so intern for a day. For those that maybe new to the channel or new to Four Horsemen Studios and the Legion's Lines, Intern for a Day is an event where we quite literally open up the doors of Full Horseman Studio and welcome in friends and fans. Um, it is not an actual internship. You're not really doing any work. Uh, what you are doing is you are coming down and you are our guests for the day to learn more about how we make these toys. So you come to the studio. We have a bunch of different sessions that we do, uh, you know, and everyone we break the group into with the, the whole attendees, we break them into different groups and you get to do all the different workshops. Like every, you don't have to pick and choose. Everyone gets to do all of them. We just rotate, but you get to sit in for uh, Eric Treadaway doing a sculpting demonstration. And he literally takes requests from the audience. Like he says, what do you want me to sculpt? And he sculpts it on the screen while you watch him. Um, Jim takes people around and does a full studio tour, which is fascinating because not only our studio, but the studio, the, the prop shop that we share space with, um, Nate Barch is there doing an art demonstration. Trevor Williams is there doing a photo demonstration. Both Sherry and Cameron take different groups and they do painting demonstrations. Um, there's a ton of cool stuff to do for that day. So there's that part of it. Um, additionally, this is part of the Mythic Weekend festivities. So Mythic Weekend is intern for a day. G Con and then Legions Con. And Legions Con is a separate thing, but obviously most people, if you're going to come into New Jersey, you're staying for the whole four days. Uh, those who are selected to be interns, and again, there is a lottery. So if you go to, let me bring that up next. If you go to uh, sourcehorseman.com slash intern, you will get to the intern for a day lottery page. Just fill out the form. There's no obligation. Like if you, win, you know, there's no, there's no cost to enter and there's no obligation. Should you win? Should your name be picked? There's no obligation. You don't necessarily have to. If you say, Hey, something's changed. I can't do it. Not a problem at all because tickets are not free. Tickets are $300 to come for that. You do get to bring a guest. You get all day at the studio. Um, interns get gifts. Uh, any gifts we give out are for interns, not necessarily for guests. The past few years, we've also done a pop-up shop at the, the studio that day. So you can actually shop for stuff before Legion's Con, so you don't have to wait in all those crazy lines. Like last year, for instance, all of the reinforcements, they were all available at intern. So people got to get those early, that which was super cool. Um, 
besides that, you do get to come back to GCon on the following day. And last year we made GCon available to the general public. We plan on doing that again, but interns get priority seating. So you will be the first ones we let in so you can get closest to the front and get the best seats in the house. So that is open now. Um, we will be taking submissions until uh, April 11th. So April 11th, at that point, we're going, at the end of the day, we're going to close that out, look at the list, and it is just a random number generator to draw the names for this. Shortly after that, we will contact all the interns to let them know they've been selected and to see if they want to come. So yes, the cake pop truck la cake pop truck last year was sweets. We did bring dessert truck in last year. So all of the interns got some, some fun desserts. We also fed them all lunch and stuff too. Very cool. So let me take this down. So that's something, um, again, it's a lot of fun. You can see in the chat right now, everyone's saying that they very much enjoyed it. People are saying, you know, intern was great and everything like that. It is a lot of fun. Um, and it is part of that whole weekend. So that four days, the reason we put the lottery up this early, we're not going to charge you for the ticket right now. We don't send invoices till later in the year. We know people want to know now so they can plan their mythic weekend. They can determine when they need to fly in, how much hotel time they need and all of that. That makes total sense, which is why we put it up as early as we do. Um, on that note, I will mention a lot of people have been asking about Legions Con and the Legions Con hotel is sold out. So uh, I believe there's still a few rooms for the Friday night. There's some rooms for the Thursday and the Sunday. The Saturday is sold out. So if you go to the website and you try to book from, you know, Friday through Sunday or Thursday through Sunday, it's going to say there's no rooms available. The reason it's saying that is because of the Saturday, because the Saturday is not available right now. Um, there is no deposit due uh, when you book it. So a number of people have booked rooms that may not be able to make it. You know, that happened last year. There was a small amount of cancellations as people's plans change as it gets closer to event date. So there is still a chance, chance that the there will be some rooms that open up at the venue hotel but just like we did last year we have also opened up two uh hotels that are down the road and they're they're both like less than five minutes away they're both you know less than two miles so i'm gonna go to the legions con website if you go to the legions con website and you click right here where it says venue that's going to bring you down and you can see hanover marriott is where it happens we have these other two hotels as well. Both of those are overflow hotels. If you click those book now buttons, it goes to the page to book on the website with the discount already applied. Now, that being said, while the hotel is sold out, tickets for the show are not sold out. In fact, they haven't even been sold yet. Number of people have been asking us, when are tickets going to go? Did I miss it? No, you have not missed it. The goal right now is to put tickets on sale by the end of April. Like I said, we've been working on a couple things on the back end, including the Legions Con exclusive figures for this year that we want to be able to show at least some of that before we put the tickets on sale. So stay tuned. We will be having those up soon, but you absolutely have not missed out on it. Going through the comments, a lot of hopeful interns in here, a lot of people hoping that they can they can make it to this. Um, okay, so that's what's going on there. So that happened now. That brings me up to this past weekend. So this past weekend, we had two different shows, which was very, very cool. So we had part of the crew up here in New Jersey doing our, you know, ToyCon New Jersey show. That is a staple. The studio has been involved with that for a number of years. And of course, at this year's show, the big surprise, let me bring it up here. Find the photos. I have so many tabs open that I literally can't even tell what is what at this point. So I've got to click through all these tabs on my screen to find the ones I want to show you. Oh, come on. Here we go. There he is. So obviously, as I said earlier, the big surprise at ToyCon New Jersey was the return of Corn Boy. 
Um, thank you to everyone that came out to the show in New Jersey. You guys braved some horrible weather to hang out with us. Um, Diego, Cookie, Vern, and Corn Boy were absolutely thrilled to see you there. And I know just from the comments that I saw in the cabal, people were absolutely thrilled to see Corn Boy out there as well. So that was going on over here on the East Coast and still on the East Coast, but a little bit further south was Toylanta. So this is the second year in a row that we have done the Toylanta show. Um, the second year in a row that I've gone down and it, it was a great show last year. Treated us really, really well. So I was excited to come down and be a part of it. And I flew in on Thursday morning. And if you caught my show a few weeks ago, you know that Big Dub was picking me up. Here's Dub here. Um, he picked me up at the airport and I cannot say enough about the level of hospitality and just how welcome we felt, all of us felt, um, but myself especially, by the crew down there and by Big Dub. So he picked me up. He took me to a restaurant called The Dwarf House, which is apparently the first ever Chick-fil-A. And it's funny because he says, you know, do you want breakfast? And I said, yeah, I'm starving because um, I had like a 6 a.m. flight. So he says, well, I'm going to bring you the first ever Chick-fil-A. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, I don't like Chick-fil-A. And it's like the morning, I want breakfast. But I felt bad telling him that. So he brings me to this restaurant and it was awesome. It's not like a typical Chick-fil-A. It's like a diner. And apparently it's the only one around that that is like this. But it was, I got this like, I don't know, spicy Southwestern omelet with a biscuit and some sausage. Oh my dude, it was so, my mouth watering just thinking about it. It was so so good. So great start to the trip. Then this photo is from the Museum of Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. So a few weeks ago on this show, when I kind of panned my collection, he saw my display of Palisades Muppets that I have right over here, and he thought, oh, you know what? He likes you know Muppets and Jim Henson and stuff. Maybe he would enjoy. The Museum of Puppetry Arts, which of course, yes, I absolutely would. So we went there and it's not a huge museum, but it is so, so cool. They have this awesome exhibit that has a bunch of different puppets from Henson's career, not only Sesame Street and the Muppets, but also the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and just a lot of other stuff. They also have another section as well that's like puppetry throughout the world like puppets throughout the world that were just fascinating like to see the historical puppets in that room as well from all different areas of the globe that was super that was incredibly cool um my favorite i do like Bert and ernie my favorite sesame street character is cookie monster cookie monster and oscar the grouch they're like a close one and two so it was very very cool to be able to see that cookie monster uh you know, puppet there as well. So really cool. My favorite from the Muppet show is probably Gonzo's. I get it. I get to see Gonzo as well. I do like Dr. Keith and the Electric Mayhem. They didn't have a full set of those. So I took the Gonzo picture instead, but that was absolutely excellent. And then we went to Dub's house afterwards. Um, amazingly, I don't have pictures of Dub's collection. Um, I'd rather him share those anyway, but I think I didn't take really many pictures because I was so overwhelmed by it. It was absolutely, and I, I told him this multiple times all weekend, it's the coolest, most curated collection I've ever seen beyond just the toys, like the custom art that he had in there for, I'm a big Winnie the Pooh fan, so is Dub. There was a lot of Winnie the Pooh like cartoon stuff in there that I absolutely loved. It was very cool. So, I'm literally a Thursday right now. Dude brings us over, treats me, brings me to this museum. He had a, a party at his house, like hosting people at his house. We haven't even started the week yet, the, the show yet. And already this has been an absolutely epic experience. Then we get to actually do Toylanta. Um, let me see what I have for photos here. Mm. So Toylanta as a whole just incredibly fun experience uh lots of great people but we also had some surprises there so i want to show some of the surprises that we had starting with the the packaged uh 
Outpost Zaxius figures. Where is that photo? So the Outpost Zaxius figures, we had all of those on display. And that's something that had just come into the studio. And I had mentioned that when Chris told me, oh, yeah, all those came in and Joe told me, I said, let's bring those down to Toy Lantel. Let's bring those things. Um, yeah, purple box box. Uh, I know they've shown this on the afternoon show as well, but being able to see these figures, having them there on display was super cool. And judging by how many people asked me if these were for sale, I feel like this is going to be a very, very popular Cosmic Legions wave. Um, we've got Talion Shun right here. If you love that Thrace head sculpture, Talion has the, this head sculpture as well. So this is a really good one. Um, probably my favorite in the wave is here, the, the Tusk Pilot, which the Tusk Pilot in the package doesn't look as impressive as when it's got the full armor in the shoulder pads and the helmet on, just because that shiny like candy apple red that Joe painted on it is so good. So the more of that armor you can get on there, the better it actually looks. I love this figure. I'm so excited for it. We actually had a loose Callion and a loose pilot that were in front as well. And these are package samples. So these are the figures that, I mean, these are production figures. These are not like uh okay approve any of these these this is what we're going to be getting this is the final check they're basically sending them to us early so we did have a poster at the show saying that these ship i think we said june um these will be on the water probably within the next few weeks that's the plan these i've been saying for a while that these are the next figures are going to be shipping so in the next few weeks these should be on the water of course as you know it takes a month, sometimes a little bit more than a month to get over to the, you know, our port, then it's going to get through customs, get over to the studio. So shipping in a few weeks from the factory doesn't mean they're going to be shipping from in a few weeks to our, all of our pre-order customers, but it's getting closer. It's seeing them in these packages is absolutely very, very close. Um, this was another one that was very popular. Obviously, uh, Aya Cypidian is a very popular figure. The Greyborns. Altar, I think, is going to follow up. Altar is interesting because he's got all of those really intricate paint applications in his head that we didn't see on on Aya's. So I think that's really cool to see here as well. Um, love this figure. Really good soft, ro soft goods. Um, the one figure we did not have was Scourge, but we did have Operative 83. So if you've seen the Operative 83 and the Scourge from PowerCon, they're the exact same figures, but they're packaged differently. So you can see that these, the ones at PowerCon came in orange boxes, because at that time, all we had were the Valkatar boxes. So the outer shells are similar to Valkatar. This, these here, they have the new purple color that we did with Outpost Zaxius. Additionally, Operative 83, the one from PowerCon, I want to say it's packaged with the human looking head on it. Um, I definitely know it's packaged with a different head than the, the Vrykolex that's on this one. And that was intentional. Additionally, the graphic on the front is the render is different as well on this one. So that's kind of a cool, but the figure itself is exactly the same. And then the last one that we had there was the Spexian Miner. It's got that kind of albino white and pink type color. This is one that I'm telling you, when you get this in hand, it's going to surprise you because the body, the armor that looks just like it's flat black. Like I, I heard people at the time of solicitation say that this should be, uh, a legion builder it has so little paint and they couldn't be further from the truth the level of paint applications in that white area along even with the armor the armor is not one color it does have a lot of like gray piping on it and stuff there is some color in there it's just dark it's dark on dark so until you have it in hand i don't know that you're going to see a ton of it but it's going to be cool now, besides that, let's see what else we had there. The other thing that came in that was very, very cool was 
paint samples from the studio, from the factory of figures from the current uh, 2024 retailer appreciation wave. Now, that was very cool because what we were telling everybody there, what I'll tell you now is, you know, it's great when we go to shows and we bring prototypes, the hand painted prototypes from the studio. Those are the things that we use for the photography. That's the stuff that we have at like G-Con and et cetera. Um, this is actually from the factory and it shows how far along in the process we are. When we solicited that wave, which is open for pre-order now through our retailers, and we said our goal is to have these shipping from retailers by the end of quarter three this year. So that's September. That's We're talking September, October timeframe is when we're going to be shipping these, like when retailers should start shipping them. Um, that is a very, very short window. And we've told the retailers, we've said, look, you April 12th is when those orders are due. You need to place your order by April 12th or you risk missing out on this wave because we are not, this is not a wave that has to be tooled and everything where there's going to be a lengthy process where if someone submitted a few weeks late, it's not a huge deal. We're placing the order right away because we want to get this into production immediately. And you can see that here, the fact that the factory, you know, we sent them the prototypes of this a while ago. They've already gotten us these paint masters for us to approve. That is exactly what you are seeing here. It's also interestingly why if you notice like the, the discs on the arms are not painted. The final one will just use black discs there, but because this is just a paint master, they don't care what discs they use. They just use whatever they have. So that's why those are the wrong color in this instance. What's up? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you were asking me a question, Curtis. I, I read what's up and I went to answer it. Um, so very cool to be able to see that. And we did have, you know, I'll, I'll bring up a close up here. So you can see, you know, the paint applications from the factory. This is a head that I really like that. In the product photography from Trevor, um, this was one of the heads that it's in the accessory shop, but he didn't pop it on the figure. So I loved being able to pop that on so you could see that. And of course, the, the ones I'm sh showing here only have the fabric upper arms and legs. I'm not showing the, the tusk armored ones. Those were in the display case at the show. Um, and then we got a lot of people that really were excited about this. So the weapons that the, the shadow circle, this character comes with have more paint applications than we've seen on some of the weapons to date in the cosmic regions line, the, especially the tusk, right? Cause the first three tusks that we did, the Sentry, the science officer and the engineer, they were legion builders. So by design, their weapons and their bodies don't have a lot of paint. That's why they're legion builders. That's why they're the lower price. Um, the only tusk that we've done to date that has full paint applications is Slygord, the Gravekeeper fit set. Uh, now, obviously, we've got in the Zaxius wave that we just looked at, the pilot is a fully painted tusk figure. Even the Operative 83, while he's not tusk, he's wearing tusk armor. So even that one, I know a lot of people are going to use him as a tusk character, and he works great for that. But even those figures that are fully painted don't have the level of paint applications that Joe did to these. Yeah, and Joe's in the chat right here where he says, I may have overdone it on these. These uh, Fisher Rice is one that Joe painted. Joe also painted the Tusk Pilot, as I mentioned. So he really, really went above and beyond adding paint applications to those. And the factory took his paints and did a wonderful job. Joe was very excited when this figure came in and he was able to to see all of that here in person. So very, very cool. Um, I will tell you, and I said this today to one of the comments on, someone was asking a comment about like, you know, are, are retailers gonna have this wave into the future? And, you know, what I said is that retailers have to place their orders by April 12th. So if they have any available for pre-order after April 12th, it's because they ordered extras. But that extra is a limited number. Like however much extra they decide to order as other orders trickle in over the next few months, 
they're going to get to the point where it sells out. Now, this particular wave, this particular figure in this entire wave, remember, this is not something we will be carrying at Source Horseman, which means you'll never see an in-stock sale on our website for it. We will not have it at shows. So saying, I'm just going to wait till they come in to get it rather than pre-order it, that is not the strategy on these. If you do that, you're going to miss out. We're seeing a little bit of that with the Lee J figure right now. The amount of retailers that have reached out to us asking if we have extra Lee J figures because that figure hit and has become so much more popular than I think anybody anticipated. So we have a lot of retailers that have sold out and are scrambling to get extras. But because this is not something we ordered extras of for ourselves, it's very hard, if not impossible, to fill those. And you're going to see some of that with this wave as well. So a lot of our retailer partners, they don't charge money up front or they charge a very small token deposit to place your pre-order. Um, my suggestion to you is if you want to make sure that you get these figures, you get for share rice and any others in the retailer wave pre-order by the beginning of April, by the end of that first week of April, so they can understand what numbers they need to place accurate pre-orders. If you go to sourcehorseman.com slash retailers, that will give you a list of our retailer partners. Let's see what the comments are here. Mm. Mm. Checking out the comments. <laughs> Curtis saying, I would buy an entire line of Joe Vasopolo repainted Tusk figures. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. And Joe's, as usual, humble, humbly deflecting uh, the, the praise and turning that spotlight on to somebody else saying, Eric approved it, so thank him. Very cool. So love this. Um, let's see what else was going on. So the other thing that we did that was a lot of fun at Toylanta was we did a panel discussion. So let me share this tab. So this is something that we did and uh, Big Dub moderated this for us. We had Jim, George, Joe, and myself on the panel. We left Matt back at the table uh, holding down the fort for us. Thank you very much for that. Our Uber driver for the weekend, Matt. Uh, but we had this uh, panel discussion. We had some wonderful banana pudding as well, which was great. And we just did a straight Q&A. Dub had solicited some questions from the community that we answered. And we also answered questions in the crowd. Uh, we did that last year at Toylanta, which was a lot of fun. We did it on the at the end of the GCon broadcast last year when we were trying to kill time. Uh, but then we also are looking to do that more frequently. So we did that here. Um, we have an event coming up called uh, Ishcon. Ishcon is going to be uh, August 3rd. That's down in North Carolina. And one of the things we're going to be doing there as well is going to be a private Q&A for the people in the room. So something we very much enjoy doing, being able to answer questions uh, of people about the process and the products and all that stuff. So love doing that. Thank you very much to Dub for moderating that and to everyone that joined us. Here's a shot from the... Uh, the room you can see jordan right there right in the front row decked out in all his purple his purple gear gear so that was very very cool uh, let's see uh, no there are actually two so the shadow circle does have the two blue heads it's got the one that's the six-eyed character and it's got the one that's attila basically yeah, those are those are both blue, and then it's got the two tusk helmets that are the black armor. Yeah, awesome. Let's see, yeah, they are the same. Sig, they are the same color. They are the same. Let's see. Okay, why are they the same color? Because it looks cool. There's there's not much of a reason beyond that. Um, I mean, why are all the fury are why are all the fury clans red? Um, I mean, there are different alien species that can have different color heads. Um, there's not, at least at this point, a deep story behind why that that those two different heads have those two color heads. Uh, you know, 
Obviously, that was done as a bit of a homage to an old Fisher Price toy. So that's really where the the color scheme for that came from. Yeah, Orc saying it was a great panel. Um, so there is, if you weren't actually at the panel, there are a few people that did uh, record that. I know that Billy Beige posted on his channel uh, like a full panel that he did there. Um, and even... I, I know that uh, Tanya from Legion's Ladies, I don't know if she posted the full panel. I know that she did a bunch of interviews over the weekend. That was very, very cool. There we go. So simple tricks and nonsense. Shape-shifting aliens who maintain skin tone between species forms. I like that. That works. That works good for me. Uh, let's see. So speaking of simple tricks and nonsense, so we met john and rebecca for the first time last year uh down in toylanta and they blew us away when they came over with their cosplays of the deluxe skeleton legion builder and the goblin legion builder um super super cool people they they came down to legions con they were a part of that last year so that was very very cool um they've become friends of the studio we were thrilled to be able to spend time with them again at Toylanta this year. And they once again blew us away with their cosplays. So they were sharing them in the cabal and on their channels. If you're not following their social channels as well, you are doing yourself a disservice because they are incredible artists with the work that they do, not only Legion's uh, cosplays, but tons of others as well. Throughout the weekend on Friday night, they uh, John was War Duke. And uh, Rebecca was uh, like Bionic Girl. It's, it was a cosplay I'm not personally familiar with. Uh, on Sunday, they were Snake Eyes and Scarlet from G.I. Joe. And then, of course, on Saturday, uh, Rebecca was Thrace Wraith Haler. And John was near and dear to my heart, was Emer Kaspar. So incredibly cool to see those designs come to life and actually walk around and, and greet fans and take photos. So I cannot say enough about how excited I was to see them there, to, to spend some time with them as well. They will both be at Legions Con again this year. I cannot wait to see what they pull out at Legions Con because last year they absolutely blew us away with their Red Death and Alithia cosplays. So this year, oof. They set the bar high for last year. We'll see what they will do this year. Cornboy is in the chat. Cornboy, thank you very much for joining us this evening. He's apparently all over the place now, making up for lost time. He, Like I said, he was at uh, ToyCon this weekend. Now he's blowing up the chat, and my chat is blowing up with well wishes that the king is here. Cornboy, yes, absolutely. And then we've got a whole lot of corn emojis that are that are that are hitting now as well appropriately so very very cool to see that and as i said very cool to be able to hang out with john and rebecca this weekend and that's a big part i think of the experience as well actually here's another photo of their cosplays i mean the fact that they had the the light up staff that she had the light up staff for thrace is just so good Oh, actually, here's another shot. So this was actually the display of the, the figures that we had, the Outpost Zaxius figures. And then you can see the Callian Shun and the Tusk Pilot that were set up right in front of them. And as I was saying, the, the meeting people, hanging out the community, this was a photo that they shared and they talked about on the 4 o'clock show this afternoon, but it bears repeating. So this was our Saturday night dinner, um, and it shows, you know, obviously Jim is in the Pope chair there. This is at a restaurant called uh, Buca de Peppo, which is, it's basically like a family style Italian restaurant. So the dishes are very large. They're meant for sharing. So what you do is you get a handful of different dishes and everybody takes a little bit onto their plate and shares it. Um, in this particular room, it was in the Pope room. In the middle of that table is like a turntable. So you can put the dishes right on that and spin them around the table so people get them, which was very fun. But you can see we've got, you know, Jim clearly in the Pope chair, but we've got um, going 
clockwise. We've got Matt Stein, myself, Big Dub, Joe Vasapolo, John and Rebecca from Simple Tricks and Nonsense, Billy Beige. We've got Van and Jordan from uh, Purple Gang Gang. Between them is seated Cullen. And then, of course, George is at the end. So having a dinner like this, like this was a ton of fun. Just being able to get out, have conversation with people, connect with people on, uh, you know, a friendly level outside, like, you know, I'm not behind the table and there's, they're talking to me. We're at the same level. We're enjoying a meal together. This I think is a big part in stepping aside from my official role for a little bit. I think stuff like this is why the studio has seen the success we've had is, you know, the fact that we genuinely enjoy hanging out, you know, at these shows, we genuinely enjoy meeting everybody, spending time with them. Unfortunately, we can't go out to dinner with everybody, um, but being able to do gatherings like this are a big reason why I think people have looked at the studio and looked at these lines the way they do, and they they feel like they're supporting their friends because there's definitely a measure of that. We certainly consider the Legionnaires part of our friend group as well, so Thank you very, very much. Yeah, Big Dub, the Sunday was an all-time moment that deserves to be in the book. I do not have a photo of me with the giant Sunday, but they absolutely, they 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 did share that on the afternoon show today. <laughs> so that was, that was good. Buka, I had never been to Buka before, and there's actually one in uh, Columbus next to where we do PowerCon. So two years ago when I went to my first PowerCon, we did Buka after on the Sunday night, and it was a huge group of us. We did it again this year, another huge group. It was so much fun. Yeah, happy you guys enjoyed it. Simple tricks and nonsense. I don't know if I'm talking to Rebecca or John right now or both of you, but yeah, we were thrilled to have you there with us. So thank you very much for coming and everything this weekend. Any other photos that I have to share? Let's see. I'm trying to see if there's anything I may have missed. I think I covered all of the photos that I wanted to. So it's kind of a rundown of what happened over the weekend, the stuff that was revealed, the secrets that were dropped and everything. If anyone has any questions on any of that, hit me up in the chat. But I've got about a half hour left and I thought it would be fun. I was to just talk a little bit of lore because I was listening recently to the mythic enablers podcast so i have listened they have three episodes out now i've listened to all three of them this was actually from the second episode and it's funny because i don't know about you but whenever i listen to content like that there's times that i want to like chime in i want to jump in yeah joe saying room sales um they covered room sales pretty heavily on the afternoon show but the room sales were a lot of fun at Toylanta. We had a blast. I won't retell all those stories because, like I said, they covered all the good stories in the afternoon show today, Joe. So I don't want to uh, repeat all that content, but they were fun. And I did love the fact that the first person to buy something, and arguably the coolest thing that was purchased, was Jim buying his set of vintage jarts, lawn jarts. Um, but anyway, back to the mythic enablers, you know, I listen to these podcasts and they talk about stuff and I want to, I want to kind of talk to, I want to contribute. So they were talking about something recently where I forget how it started, but they were talking about different characters and they were mentioning the, like the deluxe Legion builders wave and how, the, the dwarf in that wave is part of the army of Leodiceus, which they didn't understand. And then also that the gladiator is part of the army of Leodiceus. And they said the gladiator, I would have expected it to be part of the, you know, the uh, house of the noble bear. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because I think that there are some interesting lore type things. And they did finally come around and they said, well, you know, the Colosseum where the gladiators were to fort is part of Leandor. So I guess it does make sense that they're part of the army of Leodiceus. And that was 
100% the thought process there, where they are right that the Mercurian Coliseum, which does play a role, a pretty important role, actually, in the upcoming Mythic Legions book, not the one we talked about at the start of the show, but the the storybook, The Rise of the Dark Four. So when we unveiled the Atlas the Conqueror figure uh, this past year, and we put out some content, that alternate look of him as a gladiator, Bjor the Victorious, talked a little bit about the Mercurian Coliseum. So you know that it does play a role in this book. Um, the gladiatorial battles that happened there, they were underneath the army of Leodiceus. Like Mercurios is... They are part of Leandor, but because of their distance, they kind of almost govern themselves in a way, but they essentially pay fealty to Leandor, and they are technically part of them. So these characters, these gladiators that are in there, some of them absolutely would be part of the army of Leodiceus. The ones that would be part of the uh, House of the Noble Bear would have been ones that presumably were part of the rebellion along with Atlas, and decided to eventually join him in the north. But that gladiator, you know, that's a legion builder. It doesn't have a buy or a story. So, you know, one of the things, that can be a character that's a character from the past. That could be a character when, because there are no more gladiatorial battles in Mercurios at this stage. That the Colosseum fell, that practice ended. So, any gladiator character would have been from the past at this point. Former gladiators. That's why you see characters like Calavius listed as a former gladiator. So that's one thing. The other thing they were talking about was the dwarves. And the dwarves are a very interesting. I forget how they actually said it, but they had mentioned that. And by the way, me saying this, I, I love their show. I wanted to contribute to the conversation. This is me basically weaseling my way into that conversation because I couldn't do it live. So please do not mistake me saying that they don't know what they're talking about. I loved their conversation and wanted to contribute to it. So that's why I'm doing this. Um, but one of the things they had mentioned about the dwarves was, you know, they were surprised that, you know, so the dwarves weren't part of, you know, the different factions that they should have been. Um, they were surprised it was part of Leodiceus. And the dwarves are an interesting class in uh, an interesting race. It's so hard. I'm talking and I'm reading comments. So Stephen says, has writing the book caused you to research history like various social structures and ruling classes? Yeah, there's. I definitely do look a lot of that stuff up. Um, but anyway, I digress. I need to more about the Black Knights. Yeah, we do cover the Black Knights in some detail. The Fun little aside, the Black Knights were one of the problems I had to work around. There were a hand, because anything that's in a bio, I had to figure out, I had to keep the bios as canon. Like I wanted the bios to be accurate. So the fact that the Mercurian Coliseum is part of Leandor and the Black Knights were guards there, but they're part of the Legion of Aerithir, I had to explain that. Like, how does that actually work? So there is an explanation for that in the book. But anyway, I digress. Dwarves are an interesting race because they're one of the original races. So when you read the book and you read about the creation myth, um, and it talks about the, the great mother, Selene, creating all the life, she actually creates the dwarf. She looks under the mountains and the caverns and stuff, and she creates the dwarven folk. Um, so they are one of the original races created. Now, just like there are humans that are part of literally every single faction dwarves are like that as well dwarves can be part of multiple factions and that's that's really the way that i've always envisioned the dwarves in mythos is they are a race that is very populous and they've now spread out throughout mythos and they are part of all of these different uh factions now leandor specifically the evergrey mountains where there are quite a few dwarves that is the Evergrey Mountains are right in Leandor as well. They're right in like the Leandor Arathorn kind of area. So they're already geographically in that kind of space. Um, you know, the fact that the the cavern dwarves and King Bromden, that they have actually, you know, gone to the side of the Legion of Air there because they believe that their lot is better served by 
you know, aligning with Erythir and with his armies, they believe that that's going to be better for their people as a whole. They've made that decision, while other dwarves are part of other factions here. We actually see dwarves, I mean, we've seen them in the Convocation of Basilia, right? Because we've got Joran Runeshaper. Now, the Convocation of Basilia, they're, they're one of the most diverse factions because they're really driven not so much by geography, but by education. So the Convocation of Basilia in the book, we talk about the fact that they welcome actually anyone that has magical like abilities, anyone that's adept and, and shows promise for the magical arts, they'll actually welcome them into the convocation and into the schools of Ophidian to train them. They don't have to stay as part of the convocation, they can actually leave. So we've actually set it up where uh, a character like Faustia, for instance, Faustia is a battle cleric from the army of Leodiceus. She presumably trained at one point at the Tower of Ophidian. So she trained at those schools, but then she left and she went back to her faction to use her skills there as part of that section of the Legions of Light. Others have remained as part of the convocation, including Joran Runeshaper. We do also see dwarves in the Xylona's flock. My opinion is actually Xylona's flock is the area where they are the most unusual. Um, Orn Steelhide and the Dwarves of Emberdale, they are a different kind of dwarf. It actually talks about how they prefer being, you know, in the trees and above ground versus in the caverns. That's uh, a dwarfin kind of like sub race that we barely scratched the surface of, but they're certainly there as well. We also see them in uh, the Etheron, the Order of Etheron with Sir Valgard, obviously, you know, that. That I don't think is a leap. Those are all knightly type, you know, pious characters. It makes sense that a dwarf could be there. Um, we've seen dwarves now in the convocation, not convocation, the congregation of Necronominus with the undead scaly bone splitter. We've got it clearly in the Legion of Erethir. I just mentioned with King Bromden in the Cavern Dwarves and Bothar Shadowhorn. We haven't seen a dwarven vampire. So that's one faction they're not in. Um, we haven't seen them in the Circle of Poxus, and we haven't seen them in the Sons of the Red Star. They certainly could be in the Sons of the Red Star. That's another catch-all type group that is affiliated based on what they do, their activities, versus like, you know, Alithia's brood is very much the vampires and their brood and spawn. So really, when you look, and obviously House of the Noble Bear, so really, from the standpoint of you know, proliferation throughout the realm, the dwarves are, I think, one of the most diverse and populous of those races. If you look at, you know, humans would probably be the only one that I think is as diverse because humans are in quite a bit of the different factions as well. I don't think besides humans, there's anyone as diverse as the dwarves. Let's see. So I'm looking at the comments here to see what people are asking me about yep arizak defected that's different though like the fostia didn't defect so one of the things that's cool about the convocation of basilia is when they train you, they don't require you to swear them fealty. So if they train you and you leave to go back to a heroic faction, you're not betraying them at all. Like you swear certain oaths that you won't, you know, take that. You, you won't like teach some of the secrets to others because they want to keep, they have a certain way they want to teach and they want to protect that teaching. Um, but you are absolutely welcome to go back to your faction to be able to uh you know take those skills um sir andrew from the order of etheron is another one when joe vasapolo wrote sir andrew's bio you know he's someone that was trained and he actually has a connection to jordan runeshaper he was trained as a pyromancer 
in the convocation of Basilia. You know, his bio, he actually exhibited very destructive tendencies with those powers before he could control it. So he was trained in the schools, but then he left to go join the Order of Etheron. And all that's above board. That's cool. Erizak is very different. Erizak went to the Legions of Dark. So he very much did defect. That's not being trained and then going to take those skills back to his heroic faction. He was greedy and he wanted more power and more knowledge. And he took what he knew and he brought it to the circle of Poxus because he felt that he would be able to have his ambitions more effectively met under that evil faction. Hmm. Uh, with the overwhelming positive reception of Arizak's expressive sculpt, as the studio talked much about making a more those a more frequent inclusion. Yeah, we have actually. I mean, we've said in the past that those type of moment in time, like portraits, you know, they certainly have their place, but we have been doing more of them. Um, Monkey King's another one. So Monkey King does come with that snarling face as well. That I think would be similar to the Arizak head where it's same character, two different expressions. So it is something we've talked about and it's something that I would expect we'll see more of in the future. Maybe not every single character, but certainly it's something that I think you'll see more of. Uh, lore wise explanation for Gold Knight in one faction and Gold Knight two in another. So really simply, Gold Knight one has no answer. Gold Knight one, there's no bio with that character. It was literally just thrown into a faction early on. A lot of the early figures that weren't named characters, they wasn't a lot of additional lore thought beyond that. That being said, they're knights in gold armor. That is certainly not unique. So the fact that, because and, and, we talked about that with Gold Knight 2, I wanted to put Gold Knight 2 in the army of Leodiceus versus in the order of Etheron for a variety of reasons asking much to cookie chagrin do we have to does gold knight 2 have to follow gold knight 1 we decided that gold knight 1 was it was an unnamed character it had no bio so the fact that two different characters two different types of soldiers could both be wearing gold that didn't seem like it was going to be a problem. So Gold Knight 2, that story, it made more sense to put that character into the army of Leodiceus. Looking all the comments here. Very cool. All right. So I think I got all of the comments. Oh, wait. So great question here. Uh, how is Four Horsemen so knowledgeable on medieval armor design, books, museum exhibits, past academics? So much logical design and replication of real world details and armor. That's 100% Eric Treadaway. So you know, Eric has obviously been doing this for 30 years now. He's got a ton of experience when it comes to that. But we also literally live in an age where so much information is at our fingertips with the internet that researching a lot of that armor, seeing incredibly detailed photos of it, it's so much easier to research that type of stuff today than it used to be. That being said, Eric has absolutely been to exhibits and seen stuff like that and taken that in. But he also asks other people. It's not just a vacuum. Um, we talked about on the Rising Suns wave about some of the more Nordic Viking-like elements there. Diego had some influence on those. And a lot of that comes from Diego and his LARPing that he does. You know, they've done so much research and he that's something that he cares so much about that having an expert like that in the studio is invaluable. Cameron's another one. Cameron is just a well of historical information, especially when it comes to different armor and armory and stuff, um, weaponry and everything. So asking Cameron for, you know, comments on some of this stuff, that's super helpful. And sometimes... You know, 
the answer may not be definitive, but it's enough to narrow down the research. So really the answer is all of the above. You know, when Eric is designing some of this stuff, you know, again, there's some stuff he does that definitely the Red Shield Soldier is very much a historical armor design. There's not a ton of fantasy bent on it where some of the other stuff has more of a fantasy bent on it. So, yes, lots of different research, all of the above. Sir Andrew already selling out at retailers. Yeah, I mean, so that's what happens again, as I've said a number of times, this is a pre-order driven line. So while there are certainly some waves and some figures that are easier to find well after they've arrived, that's not always going to be the case. There's always going to be figures that were ordered in smaller numbers that after the fact, people are going to say, you know what? I skipped that one. I'm going to pick that one up now. It's that, it's, it's that inevitable kind of like spiral where the most popular figures are the ones that are ordered in the highest demand, but the ones that are not ordered as high, it's because people didn't pre-order them. So those are the ones that after the fact, people are like, Hey, I didn't buy this one. I want to buy it. But because they were ordered in lower numbers, there's fewer to go around. They become harder to find. It's a weird thing where the popular figures after the fact usually end up being easier to find the figures that weren't as popular originally tend to be the harder ones that go up in price it's been like that since the beginning of the line yes the book is absolutely in wave order that's something that was really important to me because kevin i want you to be able to go through the book and see the progression like on the website, it's alphabetical because it just makes sense to do the checklist page alphabetically. But for the book, I want it to feel like, and I, I said this at the at MuskeeCon a couple weeks ago, if you've been around the line since the very beginning or even since the earliest days, you know, this is going to feel very nostalgic. This is very much going to be like... Uh, a step back in time where you're going to reminisce and remember all this stuff. And you're going to look through all these waves. If you're newer to the line, I think it's going to be just as cool, just different where you're going to be able to learn a lot about those early waves and what was going on and how different things were back then. So I want you to be able to read the book and go through the figures and really see that progression over time. Cause you're going to see it. When you look at those initial figures and you look at the later figures, you can't help but see what the community support, what the move to digital sculpting, what the success of the line has allowed the line to become. So sequential by wave was critical to how this needed to lay out. Let's see what we got here. Cameron might have been an armor. Cameron is someone that has had like a million unique type experiences in his life and different things he's done. So him being a blacksmith and or armorer would not surprise me at all. Okay. Uh, do I think that you're going to have a chance to get the Valiant Knight on the store? Probably not. Valiant Knight is pretty much sold out at this point. Um, but as we've said, Valiant Knight is very much a you know preview figure. When the Necronominous waves hits, all those figures are essentially Valiant Knight figures with additional items and soft goods. Um, but if you want the actual Valiant Knight, they are the, what we sold in the store, we kept a couple cases back for shows that we sold at these last two. There's really not any more Valiant Knights to go around. Mm. As much as I would love Kitsune's in Mythic Legions, Rob, there's no immediate plans for that, but you never know. Uh, in the bios, there's mention of more than two dozen droll types. Do you have them all figured out? No, we haven't sat down and said what every single one of them is. There are others that we have talked about that are that haven't been revealed yet. I have been on the go a lot lately, but I am doing fine. Thank you very much for asking. 
Yeah, Stephanie, so she says, I appreciate this year that you subtly define the good and dark light factions, the value night positioning. Um, yeah, we never really intended not to make that clear. Like the fact that the four heroic factions are part of the Legions of Light and the four dark factions of Legions of Dark, that's been something that, you know, we've known since the beginning. I, I, in retrospect, I guess we never were super vocal about it. The logos for Selene and Helios, which double as the Legions of Dark and Legions of Light, those logos have existed since the early days. You know, those pins were created years and years ago. The reason we put it on the Valiant Knight. So the first figure that we put out that we had a problem with the bio, with the faction logo, was the unknown one. Because the unknown one does not have a faction. So we had to figure out what do we put there. So we ended up putting the map of Mythos because it was more just generic. So with Valiant Knight, we said, okay, are we going to put this knight in one of the heroic factions? Are we going to just put Mythos? So because we wrote it, we wrote that character. And again, the Valiant Knight is literally meant to be a preview figure. The whole idea behind the Valiant Knight figure was to surprise drop it early at Legion's Con so the Legionnaires could get access to the new range of motion, play around with it, and get a sense of what is coming in the Necronominous wave and beyond. So we just kind of wanted to illustrate that, look, and it says right in the bio that every one of the heroic factions has knights as part of their faction. That's what that character was meant to be. It was basically just meant to be like a catch-all type knight character. Um, but there's no, like, in the story, there's not going to be a group called the Valiant Knights or anything like that. It was meant to be more a generic archetype of Valiant Knights. Let's see what else I got here. I'm getting better with the sinuses. That Georgia Pollen knocked me down pretty bad. Will we get creatures or monsters in Mythic Legions? Yeah, we are, we already have quite a few creatures and monsters, right? I, I don't know if you're a specific kind of creature or monster you were talking about. Yes, it was wonderful seeing you at Mesquite Con as well, Drunk Gizmo. Thank you very much. Oh, if I could only live with one, if I could only live with one line for the rest of my life, would it be Mythic, Cosmic, or Figura? Um, I mean, luckily, I don't have to answer that. Uh, I mean, it's Figura is my favorite, just for a variety of reasons. But Mythic is the one that I have the most of and is certainly the dearest probably to my heart because it got me into this. Um, but luckily, I don't have to answer that. I don't have to live with only one. <laughs> Sorry about the pollen. It's okay. It was well worth it. It was well worth break braving it. Is figure obscura strictly character focused or are creatures on the table? Literally anything is on the table. I mean, we've long said that figure obscura is, you know, characters from literature and legends and mythology and cryptozoology and just when you name it, all these different types of things, you know, characters that are in the public domain, like, you know, Jacob Marley and Mask of the Red Death, those are in public domain characters. Um, you know, other characters that, I mean, like Krampus, like Krampus is not from literature or anything like that. It's Father Christmas. Father Christmas is not in the public domain. Nobody owns Father Christmas. So all of those type of things are possible. You know, so far, I mean, Krampus, yes, it's, when you say like creatures, I, yes, all of that stuff is possible. The main thing, really the only, the only rule we've put around figure obscura beyond it's got to make a cool figure. Okay. We don't want to do super stylized things. Like this is not like twisted versions and, you know, because people like even with Santa, they were like, oh, it's going to be bloody barbarian Santa. You absolutely do not know what figure obscura is if you think we're doing bloody barbarian Santa. It is not that at all. It is like true 
you know, very respectful representations of these characters, not stylized versions of them, but it's got to be a cool toy. And I've seen a lot of like suggestions people make that it's like, that's a cool character. It's a cool story, perhaps. It's not visually a cool toy. Like it would be a boring toy. So that's one of the things we always think about. It's got to look cool in like a respectful format. Um, beyond that, Eric's got to be excited for it. You know, he, I've said, I've told this story before, but he said to me early on when we were looking at the list of figure characters um, that we maintain and always review. He said, if I ever have to force myself to sculpt a, a figure, I'm, I'm doing it wrong and I won't do it. He wants to be passionate. He would rather skip what we have penciled in as a figure drop date than force something that he's not excited to do. So it actually ends up being a really good palate cleanser for, I think, everyone involved. Uh, I know Trevor has talked before about he really enjoys doing the figure of photos because not only do they come from something that he can draw from, but he's, he's working with factory figures as opposed to prototypes, which is night and day for what he can accomplish with those. Um, I know Eric likes being able to play around with that. I like being around to play around with that. I know the painters do. So it is just all around uh, a very nice palette cleanser. I had a lot of comments that came in, so I'm going to try to read those. Mm. Michael says, I'm new to Mythics. I wanted to get a couple of the older Templar Knights, but was told not to because they have the older bodies and the newer bodies are better. That depends on what you're looking for. The newer bodies that are going to be coming up with Sir Enoch and Sir Elijah are certainly have more range of motion. Um, the older figures are my favorite figures ever made. So, the newer figures I might like even more, but just because the newer figures might be have a more range of motion, you might love the old figures as well. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't pay crazy through the nose for some of those older figures, but if you find one at a good price, especially some of the, the Legion builders like the Dark Templar or the Templar Relic Guard, you know, both of those were available in our in-stock sale recently for $26 a piece. If you can find stuff like that, pick them up. They're great, great figures. Even if some figures coming out are going to be better, it doesn't diminish how good the older figures are. It's one of the things I think people forget sometimes. If something is better, if something comes out that's better, it doesn't mean, it doesn't make the thing that came before worse. It's still the thing. It's still as good as it was. It's still that good. There's just something now that's better. Let's see what else. And then Joe comes out and says, do not get old Templars. Well, the salesperson is saying, please go ahead, buy old Templars. Uh, let's see. How did I miss the banana pudding? Van, you were in your room taking a little nap there. Uh, Billy, would you say last year was more literature-related figure obscura? It was, but it was not intentional. So last year, all three of the characters came from literature. At no point did we sit down and say, let's make this literature focused. All the figures just organically kind of happened. Um, yeah, and I mean, even before that, Headless Horseman as well. Yes, the line has been very literature heavy so far. We are aware of that. It was never intentional to do that. So we're aware that we've gone down that, but there's so much great stuff out there. And some of the stuff like Headless Horseman, while it is from literature, it's such an iconic type character that it almost uh, exists beyond just the literature. I think Marley falls into that as well. Okay, let's see. No, a lot of comments here. Mm. Going through this, going through all the comments. Yeah, Greg's saying, I love the older Templars. He only has like 20. They're great figures. Uh, I meant fantasy creatures similar to goblins like kobolds, gnolls, or bigger monsters like dragons and griffins. Um, yeah, I mean, any of that stuff is certainly possible. You know, you mentioned goblins. I mean, there is already goblins. You know, some of those things. The thing you have to be careful about is... There are some kinds of races that, like dwarves and elves for in goblins, 
those are not those are not restricted to any one company. Um, Dungeons and Dragons has created a lot of races that they own. Like you can't do a Mind Flayer. Like Mind Flayer is owned by Wizards of the Coast. It's only sold by Hasbro. Um, so you got to be careful with some of those. We do definitely see requests for that. And there's certainly lots of custom options to make stuff similar to Mind Flayers, but you're not going to see a Mind Flayer in Mythic Legions because that is a protected type of a part of the Dungeons and Dragons IP. Mm. Are we going to see more non-spacesuit characters in Cosmics? You're going to see a lot of different things in Cosmics. Cosmic is just, just getting started. You know, it's a lot of what we've seen so far has some similarities, but I mean, remember all that has been enhanced so far is Valkatar, which it's, it's like if you read the first chapter of a book and you're like, well, everyone in this chapter are all like similar. Well, yeah, they're all in the same place. They're all, you know, you're in one specific place. So it makes sense that there are some similarities there. Um, even Outpost Zaxius, that was obviously a repaint wave using the parts from the first waves. So as we start to build, it's, you know, I've talked about this before, that it's so interesting that Mythic Legions took the approach of just a massive 34 figure wave up front with so much diversity, whereas Cosmic, you know, we're not even at 34 figures yet. So we're a couple waves in. We haven't even gotten the amount of figures out in Cosmic that the first Mythic Wave gave us. So once you give Cosmic a few more years, you're going to really start to see the diversity. You're going to start to see that story unfold and get much more of a sense of what's going on in the universe of Cosmerium. Okay, so it's nine o'clock now, so I'm going to get through these comments and then we're going to call it a night. Okay, you're very welcome, uh, Kevin. It was a wonderful photo of Thrace. I was happy to include it. Uh, yes, Chris, I will personally be at Shop the Curiosity in May. Um, what's so scary about Grave Night? Have to wait and see. Uh, what about a stone or other elemental go golems? Yeah, I do. I. I've always thought that elemental characters are super, super cool. Golems, you know, ice elementals, fire elementals. So I'm totally down for those. Will the prices at the Mythic in show in Sacramento be the same as other shows? Yes, it will be. That's a street team show. So they should be charging all the same prices. $40 for standards, $30 for Legion Builders. Awesome. So with that, I'm going to call it an evening. Thank you all very much for coming back tonight. And again, thank you to everybody who participated in the shows over the last few weeks. Everyone who came out to MesquiteCon, those who came out this weekend to ToyCon New Jersey, as well as those who hung out with us and hosted us at Toylanta. Thank you all very much. I will be back here next week. Same Mythic time, same Mythic channel, where once again, we will be talking about everything going on in the world of Legions. I will see you then.